Welcome friends to another r slash malicious compliance video. Today we've got a compliance story all about wearing shorts. But first, a story from Brother P. 7pm meeting for parent convenience? You got it. As a school principal, one of my responsibilities is to solicit parents to join the Parent Advisory Council. In fact, it's written into law with specific regulations as to composition, frequency of meetings, etc. One of the requirements is that the meetings have to be held at a time convenient to parents. A decade or so ago, I was a principal of a small rural high school that was in a town that served as the hub for a larger area. Most parents of the school worked in town but lived out in the countryside, some as much as an hour away. Because of this, the only way to get parents to attend meetings was to hold them right after school at 4 p.m. Parents were either done with work themselves or could make arrangements to dip out a little early, attend the meeting, and get home at a decent time. Particularly in winter, this was important as it was pretty dark and snowy on the rural roads. Partway through the school year, the district hired a new superintendent who had an oversight of the high schools. She had come from a large, urban school district and didn't fully understand or appreciate how a rural school district worked. At our first meeting with all the principals, she asked each of us for a summary report of school operations, including parent meetings. I dutifully submitted mine as requested and forgot about it. A few weeks later, I got a call from the superintendent. We chatted, got to know each other a little bit, and then got down to the reason for her call. I see from your report that you hold your parent meetings at 4 p.m., she said. I say, yeah, it's the best time so that everyone gets home at a decent hour. A lot of people up here have long drives home, myself included. She took this to mean I had scheduled the meetings around my personal convenience. They say, well, when I was a principal, I always held them at night, so more parents could attend. I think you need to start holding your meetings later. I say, well, I don't think the parents will attend. They say, no, no, the meetings have to be open to all parents and held a time convenient to them. She insisted. I think you should start at 7 p.m. to make sure all parents have the opportunity to come. Now, in a big city school, this works fine as most families live within a short drive. But the boss is the boss. Cue malicious compliance. Okay, no problem. Say, why don't you attend the next one and introduce yourself to the parents I offered? She immediately agreed and I sent the calendar invitation for a month, hence at 7pm. My school was located about a 90 minute drive north of the administrative offices where the superintendent worked, and she herself lived about an hour's drive south of it. She was in for a long day. The day of the meeting rolled around, and the superintendent arrived at the school around 6.45 p.m. in anticipation of the meeting. She brought donuts and cookies, and I supplied coffee and water. I had set up the library with a big conference table and seating for 30. No one showed. I suppressed the urge to say, I told you so. I really enjoy this because making the superintendent not only see that nobody showed up, but wasting hours of their time in the process really must truly get through to them that their idea was a bad idea. Would you want to rub it in their face a little bit more, or is it more than enough seeing that empty room and wasting their hours like that? Let me know in the comments down below. Our next story is from Yellow Triangle, Summer in Office Dress Code. Summer is here and temperatures are approaching 85 plus Fahrenheit degrees on the hotter days. I'm located in Northern Europe, which means that this crap is hot for us. And to top it off, the humidity is off the charts. Leaving a cold beverage out on the table for a minute or two, and it's condensing as hard as I'm sweating. Puddles underneath and all. We don't have air conditioning at my office and probably never will have. When the weather gets like this, the office turns into a steam sauna, or at least a close approximation, and there's nothing we can do about it. We survive it the best we can by wearing less clothes. At normal temperatures, we wear the typical professional garb. But when the temperature rises, it's typically light dresses and skirts for the women and shorts for the men. The unspoken rule was to just keep the designs professional. No Bermuda shorts, bikinis, or clothes with eye-searing colors. You know, normal common sense. However, this year, shorts are suddenly a problem. If you've never experienced the glory of arbitrary rule changes before, then I envy you. With that bit of context, summer legs, we'll get on with the malicious compliance. What happened is, we got a new manager during the start of the year, and apparently this new manager has new manager eyes. 
Without warning, a couple days into steam sauna at work season, the new manager decided that shorts were unprofessional. And in short order, he ordered the men in the office to go back to wearing heat stroke inducing long pants. No meetings, no talking with the people in the office first, no different alternative, just here are your new guidelines, have a nice day kind of situation. Sent out over mail of course, shortly before the end of the day, the new rules were to take effect immediately. Now I was none too pleased by this. And come next day, I found out that neither were the rest of the men in the office. Mostly because each and every man went from being uncomfortably hot to now sporting his own little steam oven and in the privacy of his pants, steaming two buns and two eggs combo. Grumbles were had all around. It should be said that when I think something's unfair, I can get a bit confrontational and I won't take just because as a good enough explanation. Basically, I don't play nice with arbitrary rules. As such, during the first day after the rule change, I found a moment to press the new manager for the real explanation. As such, things have a tendency to do. After a bit of back and forth, I was finally presented with his reason. Shorts are unprofessional because no one wants to look at hairy man legs. I honestly didn't know what to say to that at first. Because how do you argue against stupid? Stupefied was the most fitting way to describe my state of mind after that bomb. As I went on with the rest of my day, I tried to figure out how to get this insane rule changed, because I sure as heck was not going to suffer more than necessary during the whole of summer. I went to my buddy to get his take on it, and to no surprise, he agreed with my take. The new manager was just power tripping or similarly changing rules for no good reason. Now the question became how to get under his skin and pull him down a peg or two. If you've ever dealt with the type of person the new manager is, then I can tell you that showing disrespect to their authority is the best way to get under their skin. And pointing out their stupidity publicly is the easiest way to enact change. Of course, with the additional added benefit of painting a target on your own back. After a good half hour, my buddy had helped me cobble a plan together, and off I went to set it into motion. First, I got confirmation on the reason for no shorts. Basically had new manager confirm over mail that shorts were not allowed and unprofessional because of hairy man legs. Then that evening I set to it at home, getting ready for wearing shorts to work the next day. When the next day came around, I peacocked into the office wearing shorts. In no time at all, the new manager was on my case, and in typical new manager style, he gave me a dress down in front of my coworkers. While he did this, I was fighting to not let a grin surface on my face. I think that humans are amazing in many different ways, one of which is that we don't always pay all that much attention to the details of mundane things, and as such can gloss over them with ease. But once your attention has been drawn to something, you basically can't ignore it or unsee it. After new manager was done stroking his ego, I broke. I couldn't hold in my smile anymore. With the biggest grin on my face, I pointed to my legs and said, But I shaved my legs? I think that broke the new manager for a full 10 seconds. He just kind of stood there taking it all in, really looking at my legs, then looking back and forth between my legs and face a couple of times. You could see him trying really hard to make sense of what happened while my coworker snickered in the gallery. After he kind of got his bearing again, I pointed out that the problem with shorts were hairy man legs, and as they were no longer hairy, shorts should no longer be a problem. I wish I could tell you that it devolved into an epic meltdown. That new manager was so far up his own butt that he was immune to reason and would ignore his own previous statement about professional wear in shorts. That the power battle in the office devolved into a battle for who would get the other fired. That didn't happen. Instead, after a short while, still surrounded by the majority of the office staff, the new manager declared that the men could go back to how it used to be. I haven't suffered any retaliation as of yet, and it seems that's not going to happen, which is good. It's also the gift that keeps on giving because I keep seeing new manager's eyes darting down to my manly shaved legs every now and again when I interact with them. I find it absolutely hilarious, and I'm honestly considering keeping them shaved until it stops demanding his attention. I've acquired a new nickname in the office, which I guess is all in good fun. Many of my coworkers have taken it upon themselves to call me by Summer Legs. 
Listen, having experienced plenty of weather where it's hot out, it's humid out, I think I'd rather shave my legs if that means I could wear shorts. Who in their right mind is going to want to go wear long pants or slacks, commonly black ones nonetheless, to a place where it's 85 plus and humid as heck, that's awful. This next story is from Puella Fortis. You absolutely need to keep your seat. So, more than 10 years ago, I made the mistake of booking a connecting flight on American Airlines. I was traveling alone with two toddlers, so I booked three seats next to one another. As we check into the first flight, they give me the six boarding passes and I'm upset to see that we're spread out over a whole section for the second flight. All middle seats, of course. It's a different airline, the one I bought the tickets from, so they claim they can't change it. So first thing during the layover, I go to the counter. Oh, we can't do anything, they'll fix it at the gate. Rush to the gate. Sorry, there's nothing we can do. The stewardess will take care of you. Of course, I made a point to be at the front of the line, all the while trying to entertain cranky kids who want to ride the train some more. The gate knew the issue, but announces that families with young kids are no longer seated early and will not make a difference for me. Eventually, we board, and one of our three rows still has two seats open. I drop the kids off and go to find the stewardess. Oh, there's nothing I can do. You'll just have to ask them to move yourself. The lady who's standing there waiting for her seat grumbles but takes one of my boarding passes. The gentleman will not move no matter how much I plead. Cue malicious compliance. I thanked him for allowing me to relax. He made a confused face. Then I opened our onboard backpack and started pointing things out. This is the portable DVD player. That should keep the older one entertained for a while. Here are the books to read to the younger one. These are the snacks. Make sure you feed them on the way up, otherwise their ears will hurt. You can get me for the bathroom run and diaper changes. As I got ready to thank him again for volunteering for childcare, he gave up and took the other seat. I have no idea what I would have done if he had stuck it out. I wasn't going to have my toddlers sit with a stranger where I can't see what's going on. If this was the kind of thing that happened nowadays where you believe that you had bought three tickets all next to each other and you just get totally screwed over the way you did here, this is the kind of thing I think is prime for Twitter and social media exposure. Even if they don't really make it up to you properly, maybe they can do some kind of at least short-term checking to make sure this kind of stuff doesn't happen again. But let's be real, it's not really going to happen with an airline company, right? And our final story of the day is from an anonymous poster. Don't want to communicate? I'll trash your stuff. Title sounds bad, but I used to work for quality control. I work multiple positions within my old place, and so did one other woman in a field of 100 men. We have standards for products. Let's say one is a fail, five is preferred, but 10 is the max. In my job, I just had to make sure what we made fell between X and Z. My other female coworker worked an opposite shift for me. She was informed by a manager that for a bit, things had to fall exactly within five or it was to be possibly rejected based on loose standards. When I got into my shift, no one had communicated that to me. So I did what I'd done for my eight plus years in the field, Past stuff if they were within 1 to 10. I also don't control the product being made. I simply test it. So if changes need to be made, it's not me to do that. People get paid way more to do it. I was getting results that were like 8. Still a pass according to our written procedures, our product specifications, etc. The manager called for my coworker several times. She often works overtime in other positions, so I didn't think much of it. I hadn't seen her that day, but her other position is fairly secluded, so I often don't know when she's there. He radios more. Finally, he radios her name again. Let's say Sarah, and says, Amy, why are your results at an 8? That clued me in that he was talking to me. I was confused because for 8 years, an 8 was fine. So I said back, because the results said an 8? He radioed across the workplace. Amy, do I need to retrain you? We need a 5. Why isn't it a 5? I radioed back that I was not only not Amy, but a 5 was a pass for the last 8 years. And if it was no longer a pass, he needed to not only form the QC, but he needed to rewrite all of our legal documents that held the specification for our products. Or at least talk to the right person. He never replied, so I listened to his instruction. I started to fail every product that wasn't a 5. No product reached that low. The entire day I wrote 30 non-compliance reports and rejected probably half a million dollars worth of products in the trash. 
The workplace manager came down to talk to me later and supported me for following directions when the manager couldn't even bother to check the schedule to ensure he was talking to the person he had directed and not giving the whole unit the same direction. I'm not gonna lie, considering OP trashed almost half a million dollars worth of products, I am more than surprised that somebody higher up said, you know what, good job following directions. I'd be willing to bet a majority of the time people would say something like, well, you should have known despite being told to do so that you were trashing thousands of dollars worth of stuff, blah, blah, blah. Either way though, I think OP's butt was covered. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now, if you want to hear another malicious compliance story that was crazier than any of the ones in this video, click on that left video. Or if you missed my latest video, click on the right. That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.